Welcome to the Mirror Talks podcast, where we deconstruct some of humanity's most disconnecting and limiting assumptions and offer an alternative, a free state of consciousness, unbiased, naturally wise, and genuinely loving. We will shed a more enlightened perspective on everyday experiences to help anyone willing realize their true potential and inspire a contemporary spiritual life lift in service to all. Say goodbye to the man-made paradigms of distorted ideas. Let's become pure, free, and actually intelligent once again. This is the first episode of a two-episode series based on being of service to others. And service to others is a choice, um, a path differentiator that takes you from having what Bentinho calls a person consciousness, or basically just being sort of self-oriented, self-focused, not really polarizing in one direction or another, just sort of being complacent and tolerant and going about life as you know it. And what this first episode does is it it sort of takes you how to how to make that decision and polarize toward service to others, really start that path of accumulating spiritual mass and becoming a shepherd or a generous beacon of radiance and and service, you know, living your calling, being what you're meant to be in this incarnation, in this life. So this is part one of two episodes based on service. The second one, which you can watch after this one, is based on uh sort of the nuances, the fine tuning between love and wisdom once you've already made that distinction, once you've made that choice. So enjoy. So welcome everybody. And uh, as you know by now, one of the things that I am to do is to map things out for the intellect. Because if we have an intellectual map of the actual territory, the map is not the territory, but the map can help us navigate through the territory of the spiritual journey. Without a map, we're kind of lost. We're just dealing with whatever our present experience is. And we lack oversight. We lack an understanding of how our present current experience and our current phase and our current stage and our current sort of vibrational paradigm of experiences fit in to sort of the overarching map or trajectory of the evolution of the consciousness of the creator in the form of us. So we are the creator exploring itself, experiencing itself, expressing itself, and ultimately knowing itself through those experiences, but also ultimately, ultimately, as standing apart from all these experiences, as being beyond all these experiences in its most naked, original, infinite state, or stateless state. So, but while we're here, so to speak, and while we have the illusory, ultimately illusory experience of an individuated mind, body, spirit complex. In other words, just your sense of being an individual with a body, with a mind, with a spirit. We, unless we somehow, like a kind of dressed in a different podcast, unless our soul, if you will, is so mature and is so ripe and it's so ready, and our minds are also ready and ripe and integrated, and balanced enough for that sort of greater quantum leap of true enlightenment. And unless we are completely dedicated to that, and we really desire that above everything else, which is typically not the case, it's just typically not the case. Um, so unless that is the case, which it rarely is, we have to kind of also know how to deal with the experience of experiencing ourselves on a day to day, moment to moment basis through the filter or point of view of the individual experience. Because it's of no use to pretend like we don't have the experience of the body, the mind and the spirit and the world. So for as long as that experience is actually there, and it actually appears solid and real to some degree. And like we said, the more you sort of go up this ladder of consciousness, the less real the illusions feel, and the more real that innate consciousness, that innate awareness begins to feel as sort of this God state of Satchitananda or existence, consciousness, bliss, or awareness, love, light. The God state, which is what the individual that's so aligned with that becomes commensurate with that state and therefore starts to exhibit 
the qualities of mirror, of the mirror being, where the consciousness is so, for lack of a better word, clean of distortions, of individual distortions, that it really kind of is like God, God's intelligence, this infinite intelligence, operates, informs the mind, body, spirit expression, whatever is left of it, so to speak, as an illusion in this world. And therefore, the entity, the individual, begins to take on a more and more purely reflective form, reflective of those that come before him or her, reflective of even the collective consciousness as a whole. Like when we're addressing something that's going to be published online, to a degree there is a reflectiveness, there's an awareness in the mirror being of the collective consciousness that is being addressed, which is naturally, because of this innate intelligence, is naturally incorporated into the lecture or talk or message. There is this ever more purely reflective quality, like a mirror that has no distortions, no wobbles, or so few that it is dismissible to the point where other people can see themselves clearly and there is no intention behind the mirror. So there's no distortion, there's just mirroring. The path in between the sort of ordinary state of the person consciousness, identify with the personal individual bubble, where the illusion seems really real, and the ego seems really tangible, and is an everyday unconscious component of one's life. This is person consciousness, this is the ordinary state of mankind. This is what most people spend most of their time um, filtering their experiences through. Where the mirror being represents kind of the individual that is so transparent to the God state, that they take on the reflective and intelligent qualities of that bliss, that love, that light, that purity. Shepherding consciousness is this long journey, typically, in between person consciousness and mirror consciousness, or mirror being. And so a lot of this information, and, and most of the people that this information is going to reach, are to some degree interested in enlightenment, and are to some degree interested in how to transform, how to move out of person consciousness and more fully establish themselves higher and higher up the ladder of shepherding consciousness and therefore approach ever more pristinely the state of the mirror or the state of God, basically. And so this is, uh, I say a long journey because it is a long journey. Um, we can condense that and we can accelerate it in this single lifetime, but in the meta perspective of the soul's journey, the soul's consciousness's journey, it is a long journey. So even if someone seems to rapidly go through these stages in this lifetime, it typically means they've already covered a lot of that ground in different experiences, they've already matured, or they're simply making a whole lot of progress with the single lifetime, which is possible. So now that that's kind of in people's minds, that we have person consciousness at the bottom, if to give it a hierarchy of evolution, which is third density commensurate. It's a focus that is oriented towards this 3D world for the most part. It's conditioned by this 3D world for the most part. And it's everyday thoughts and interactions and actions and motivations are based predominantly, there's exceptions, but predominantly in that 3D conditioned world that we believe is life. But it's just a worldly perception of the senses and the intellect, having put pictures together, thoughts together, words together. And we live for the most part in that personal consciousness bubble of me and the world, me and others. How did I start that sentence? Do you remember? Was the hierarchy. The hierarchy. Yeah. So having that sort of at the bottom, then above that is this sort of long spiritual journey stage of shepherding consciousness. Now there's many gradations in shepherding consciousness and it, it's commensurate with late third density, fourth density, fifth density and sixth density. Mm vibratory states and lessons and expansions and growth cycles and so forth. And then above that, the mirror state consciousness is commensurate with late sixth density and sort of early seventh density consciousness or the God state. And then the gateway is represented by late seventh and eighth being the absolute. But so to focus on primarily on the first three, so the journey from person to mirror, from individual to oneness, from personal to universal, 
from distorted and twisted and convoluted and confused and muddy to absolutely clear, absolute clarity and expensiveness and vastness and emptiness and freedom and clarity. The path in between that describes the path of the shepherd. I call it the shepherd because my teachings address those who have chosen to be of service to others versus those who have chosen to be extremely of service to self. So here we get into sort of the next concept. Service to self versus service to others. Um, in the love one, and I'm, I'm trying to make this more accessible, like you were suggesting, um, because a lot of this material is rooted in the love one, is inspired by the love one. So if people want to sort of get the nuances in the original language, uh, they can look up the law of one material, the raw material. But people don't have to understand that language. We, we can make it uh, accessible to how we speak and how we interact and sort of a practical day-to-day -day basis way of living. We can integrate these teachings. So let's try to make it applicable to where most people are at not assuming that they have sort of in-depth studied the law of one. So I, I'll reference one more concept of the law of one, which is that there is value, there is imperative, crucial value in polarity, the concept of polarity. Yes, this is all rooted in levels below the state of enlightenment, that is that of the mirror consciousness, because at some point in sixth density, these polarities come together and they merge into a state of unity, where there no longer really is the polarity, the polarity has been used up, the polarity of negative and positive, mm. uh, feminine and masculine, service to self service to others, egotism versus generosity, and so forth, has been exhausted. But for the vast majority of people, it is a crucial tool to accelerate their spiritual journey, one way in which they described this, and I have adopted this term as well, because I think it's very precise. Another way to describe the spiritual journey is the accumulating of spiritual mass. So again, like I said, we're going to go through quite a few concepts here, but I'm going to try to make it accessible. Spiritual mass. So in a sense, you could say, the more we are 3D focused, the more we are sort of of a materialistic orientation, of a Newtonian, skeptical, realistic, 3D bound orientation. And we're just kind of maybe we're not super selfish people in our intention, like we don't try to become, uh, you know, the next dictator or anything. Or we don't want to enslave other people to our will. So we're not like extremely negatively oriented. But we're also not activated on a path of service to others. We're most of our concerns are about ourselves. Most of our actions are about how can I secure my own position mm. and so on. This is sort of an innocent form of egotism, an innocent, ignorant form of service to self. So it mm. doesn't quite classify as being actually consciously, deliberately service to self oriented. Mm. Oh. And I'll make that distinction a little clearer later on. But so for now, there is a polarity. There's a polarity between positivity or radiance or giving or generosity, or overflowing, or moving intentionally towards the benefit of others, which includes the self. But the intent is benefit of all. It's a radiant energy. It's a positive energy. It's a service to others energy. It's a generous energy. Radiance summarizes it well. Versus the negative path is that of absorption. It is that of extracting from others. It's that of getting. It's that of in the extreme cases, enslavement of others, uh, dominating over others, getting power from others, so to speak. So there's the polarity of service to self, and there's the polarity of service to others. But you can also just call them positive and negative, plus and minus radiance and absorption. Mm -hmm. And here it already becomes more practical, like how often during the day are we radiating? Are we actually pausing our own selfish bubble, even if we're not uh, a psychopath that is set on dominating or enslaving others? So we're not deliberately consciously service to self, we're not deliberately negative, but still we carry a lot of the negative traits in a sort of 
not so powerful fashion. It's not extremely polarized. We're not polarized negatively, intensely. Therefore, it doesn't carry a lot of power. Therefore, we don't attain, say, the wealth and the power and the influence that, uh, say, a dictator reaches, which, which is an example of someone who's polarized, who has gained spiritual mass along the path of deliberate service to self, deliberate absorption. This is not the state of most humans. Most humans are actually inclined towards a positive path. They're actually inclined towards service to others. But because of all the conditioning and because of all the complacency and because of the lack of spiritual mass having been accumulated, which I'll clarify in a little bit, because of a lack of polarity, which equals the power to do work, the power, like if you look at polarity and electricity, without polarity, there is no mm. charge. Mm -hmm right? There is no charge. And if there's no charge, there's no work. So spiritual mass describes the spiritual or metaphysical equivalent, sort of of that principle of you need polarity to have charge in order to do work in order to generate experiences and so on. So along the negative path, up to six density, and along the positive path up to six density, although the positive path continues beyond six density, it's simply that the negative path cannot sustain itself in six density. Along that journey, we gain spiritual mass, we gain polarity, therefore we gain charge, we gain spiritual power, we gain knowledge, we gain willpower, we gain discipline, we gain the ability to direct our attention or concentration our consciousness, we gain self knowledge, we become clearer and clearer, and more and more deliberate. And through that deliberateness, through transcending or transmuting, sort of the muddy, confused, complacent stuff that we're born with, and that we inherit from our parents and our environment, by alchemizing that, by making that conscious and deliberate, we naturally begin to gain spiritual mass. Just like something like an object can gain physical mass and become more and more heavy and powerful and have a greater and greater gravitational force around it. Similarly, metaphysically speaking, we can gain spiritual mass, which is developed through the faculties of will and faith for the most part. But it has to be applied to something as long as we carry the illusion of I am a mind body spirit complex. And don't fool yourself in believing you don't have that illusion just because you know a little bit about enlightenment and you know that you know about the statement oh there's nobody here doing anything nobody's doing anything it's just it's all god doing it that's not sufficient and light and this is actually i'll i'll come back to all this let me just interject something here that applies to some of the other conversations we've had what's the difference between someone who knows the teachings of enlightenment and self-realization but kind of just reaches a stalemate and their enlightenment, although they are parroting the right words, and although they even believe in their enlightenment or in their I'm nobodyness, which it's a big trend in this Neo Advaita, this Neo Advaita sort of uh, culture that is part of spirituality, where we take those traditional teachings that promote mm -hmm the attainment of spiritual mass through the practice of realizing that all there is is God. But it's easy to stop gaining the spiritual mass and just kind of have the concepts, but not having gone through the journey, not having gone through the will, the discipline, the recognition, the practice, the truly mm -hmm. emptying oneself, the truly surrendering to God with great energy, with great charge, with great devotion, with great frustration, with great zest, with great will, with great desire, intense desire. One can study these teachings for 20 years, but still be in person consciousness, but simply have replaced its 3D conditioning with enlightenment based teachings or conditioning. And it can fool itself, it can actually think that it's enlightened because any attempt to not feel that way would be a form of seeking which in some of the teachings has been negated as being a sign of not being enlightened. So we pretend to give up the seeking impulse. That's why I keep hammering on the fact, never give up your seeking impulse. You can't, but don't even suppress it. Don't believe in anything that suppresses that impulse. 
because it's your lifeline to greater polarity, to greater spiritual mass, and eventually to great unity consciousness that's vibrant and alive and active. It's not a passive conceptual framework that one is stuck in that then kind of debilitates one, makes one complacent. So there's a great difference between two people that speak the same language and that know the same concepts of there's nobody here. But one feels vibrant and radiant and intelligent and clear and alive and active mm. and realized. And the other just feels like they're kind of parroting. They're kind of in mm -hmm. a blankness. They're kind of dry. It's kind of intellectual. It's kind of, there's not a lot of power radiating from these entities because they're not charged. Because they haven't adopted the polarity. And also they haven't practiced will and faith to that degree required for actual experiential enlightenment. So to come back to the former topic. In order to help us gain spiritual mass, we have the means of polarity to gain that charge. Ultimately, the charge is, you could say, neutral, or it's universal. But to gain that charge, you need polarity. You need distinction, you need difference. Otherwise, there's no contrast for there to be the arising of greater will, of greater faith, of greater spiritual recognition. There's got to be contrast in order for there to be self-knowledge. If there's only one blankness, then it will not know itself. It needs something other than itself, apparently other than itself, to begin this journey, this symbolic reflective journey. One of the results of that is the material world. It's, uh, it's the very, it's the very um, sort of final strand. It's the most visible end of the spectrum of the symbolization of the creator of itself so that it can bounce its own re self-recognition off of something that appears to be here. The illusion appears to be real so that the creator can get to know itself. And there is a sense of risk involved. There's a sense of reality involved. There's a sense of I have to involved. This inspires the seeking impulse. If we dismiss that or deny it or suppress it with spiritual language, that's spiritual bypassing, a form of. It's also a form of shooting ourselves in the foot, not attaining that true well, that true fountain of energy, of intelligent energy, which is one with the Creator. Therefore, experientially, we lack that power of self-realization. We just know the words and we just kind of feel. It's like taking a picture of enlightenment and looking at the mm -hmm. picture and showing other people the picture of enlightenment. It has no power in it. It's not the same as, you know, canoeing through the Grand Canyon. Having a picture of it is gorgeous, beautiful, it's great. It's the map of the territory. But to then suppress the seeking impulse by looking at the picture is um, unhealthy practice from a spiritual point of view. It doesn't gain spiritual mass. So again, we wish to accumulate spiritual mass, which is another way of saying we wish to accumulate free will in the deepest sense of the word free will, the freedom of our own awareness, our own consciousness, and therefore also our own choice. And choice helps us polarize, and the polarization helps to build the charge to accumulate that spiritual mass. This may all sound very abstract still, but as, as people go through this journey and they begin to apply themselves to something, whatever that concept may be, whether that's rooted in service to self or extreme absorption or service to others, radiance, service, giving, either way, in either direction, one can begin to know itself. One can, can begin to gain spiritual mass. Now, I typically don't talk too much about the negative path because it's never been my interest except for understanding it. And it's not what I don't assume that my listeners are here for that. So my teachings are all geared along the polarity of service to others. That's why it's been such a big component of my work is to inspire people to be more of service to others. Why? Because this is what breaks them out of person consciousness mm -hmm. and puts them well wow. on their way on shepherding consciousness. If you don't have the mirror, if you don't have the contrast of other people, you're just kind of in this blank state. It might be happy, it might not be extremely happy, but either way, there's no charge. There's no accumulation. There's no rapid accumulation of will, of expansion, of understanding, of knowledge, of desire, of seeking, of accumulating spiritual power, knowledge, awareness, freedom, love, and so forth. So the path has got to be energetic. It cannot be dry. 
if one wants to go far. If not, then that's fine. You can live as a 3D human being, uh, pasting all these pictures of enlightenment on your body and walk around like a person consciousness that looks to oneself and to some gullible others as uh, vibrant or alive or awake. But it's, it's just not. So what's preferable is to use, again, since we have this experience of the body, the mind, the world, spirit, we have to deal with that component. We have to interact through that filter until we don't. But again, that's a rare case. And that, that's what we're getting to by utilizing it. The purpose of this illusion is to transcend it. But you're not going to transcend it by holding a picture up of the state of transcendent consciousness. You're going to have to interact, deal with what you're experiencing. You can do this more directly. You can transcend it more directly. But again, that requires a very one-pointed type of will and desire, which typically doesn't evolve, doesn't arise in an entity until one has gone through a whole lot of polarity and taking action, so to speak and engaging in the rubber of their illusion of self, meeting the road of the illusion of other selves, aka relationship with the world, with others, and so forth. Make sense so far? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, we have this symbol around us of other selves, right? Which is a nice term, because it includes the word self. It is still the self. It's still what we are but it's an other self, mm -hmm. an other expression seemingly of the self, the big self, the self we are in truth. Since we have this experience, and since we have interest in our experience to some degree, we have to integrate that experience. We have to learn how to utilize and navigate that experience. Hence, I've created different kinds of maps to provide people with an understanding that can set them on the journey and that can help keep them on the journey in the most aligned way. So that it's an accelerated path. It's still a direct path, even in the indirect experience of the illusion relating with itself. Empowerment and so forth. Giving to others and so forth. So, because again, in the higher states, service to others is automatic. You can't help it. It's not a choice anymore. Sixth density and beyond, it's not a choice. It's just a state of being. It's just a natural radiance. But again, that requires practice. It requires the attainment of spiritual mass. So what if spirit had mass? And what if that mass of spirit could be accumulated, could be built? The charge of spiritual, of spirit, could be built in the consciousness of an entity. It could increase the density, the saturation, the brightness, the vividness, the aliveness with which consciousness knows its own true self. And therefore, it starts to radiate that light. It becomes reflective of that in, innate, undividable love light, that non-duality. Now the energy releases. Now there is a radiance. Now there is an aliveness. Now there is a power, a power to work, a power to choose, a power to give, a power to know yourself, and mm -hmm. so forth. Everything needs power. Mm -hmm. You can't turn your heater on without power. You can't turn the lights on without power. You can't listen to this recording without power. Every application of the Creator needs power. Ultimately, all power leads back to the Source. If we can tap this Source directly with our own consciousness, with our own willpower and faith and our desire and our seeking impulse by trusting it and following up on it and applying ourselves and not denying anything, not shoving anything under the rug, but also not getting lost in the myriad forms of distraction. If we start walking that path of discipline, in a sense, of concentration of deliberateness versus complacent randomness or laziness. Then we begin to accumulate spiritual mass. And you see this in people that are not spiritually versed. You know, some of the influencers or inspiring people, they've accumulated quite a bit of spiritual mass just by having an interest in a particular um, lifestyle or not so much lifestyle, but they have a passion for something and they maybe create a company out of it. And then they're having to meet other selves all the time and they have to make all these choices. It's an active entrepreneurial, if you will, empowerment inspiring lifestyle that requires one 
to gain self-knowledge requires one asks of oneself to continuously day by day apply oneself concentrate learn lessons and so forth that is an active deliberate lifestyle therefore it gains spiritual mass unbeknownst to the participant whereas someone in a more typical state where there's not really a lot of passion activated for anything where there's not really a lot of application where there's a comfort zone that's a large demographic on earth right now that kind of falls in between the service to self polarity gaining path and the service to others polarity gaining path so they're not gaining polarity along either pathway neither positive nor negative so they're not developing a lot of charge therefore they don't have the ability to change their lives very rapidly hmm. everything is slow condensed the vibration slows down there's no charge there's no aliveness there's no vibrancy there's no spiritual power therefore whatever is is and continues to repeat itself because there's no change there's no charge right the light just doesn't burn as bright with less charge so polarity although yes it's rooted in the illusion of duality it is one of the means in which the creator accelerates its path to knowing itself which ultimately mm -hmm. the polarities are released in sixth density commensurate state of consciousness which is the state of unity of love and wisdom it's the state of the integrated soul the unified self that has integrated all of its components and that's aware of itself in full glory the individuated spark of I am that is self-realized to that degree anyway it's not yet quite equal to the God state but it's that sort of coming together point of all the polarities and all the lessons into that singular point that then will lead into a desire beyond that to merge with the Creator for the that true unity experience and again as I make it sound it is quite a journey it requires application of self so you, if you kind of understand what I'm saying, then you can also see how a human being that hasn't gone through that journey of going from person consciousness into activated, deliberate shepherding consciousness, transmuting themselves, emptying themselves out, being of service to others, actively radiating, asking the proper questions, applying themselves. Yes, this is all happening in the illusory canvas of our self-projected world. It is still, it's using the properties of duality and polarity However, it's using it as it's designed to be utilized. Rather than a person that hasn't activated themselves, hasn't activated their charge, their spiritual strength, and then attempts to jump to the highest teachings of non-duality, of enlightenment, mm. of there is no self, and so forth. Mm. But you don't have the power to understand that state oh, cool. experientially. You don't have the charge to recognize that aliveness, your consciousness is in a sleepy state. So it's just kind of like, oh, it's dreaming about enlightenment. Yeah, they're often not realized, right? But they don't realize it because they haven't developed spiritual mass. They haven't charged themselves up beyond sort of an ordinary extent. They just from an ordinary state, not liking their suffering, most likely, they sought for spirituality and they heard that the concept mm -hmm. and the intellect can understand it can create a very clear picture of enlightenment you can meet people that can talk the walk all day long mm -hmm. but without the charge without the journey and so this is a false state of liberation and it's not liberation at all and if that perpetuates itself for long enough the ego starts hiding in it and then it's uh it's a trap at that point like it's hard to get out of because the language has been reprogrammed the images have been reprogrammed the concepts have been reprogrammed and now it's kind of a stalemate and it keeps itself in that dry picture version of enlightenment mm. and any attempt to now gain spiritual polarity if they hear let's say one of my talks on service to others they're like oh what nonsense doesn't match the picture i don't see any of that in my picture of the grand canyon the Grand Canyon of Enlightenment. Service to others, like mm -hmm. empowerment, like changing your belief systems. No, that's not according to this image. Mm -hmm. I'm more enlightened than that teaching. I don't need that because there is no self. That all starts, sounds like it's promoting self. It's promoting self. It's promoting ego. I don't have ego because I don't see ego in my picture, in my language, in my images. Right? So because they've... So lucky are those who have suffered 
and through their frustration with that suffering has have tried to find a way inside of the illusion to get out of it or to transmute it or to apply themselves to things more important in life than their vain desires that are cultivated by limited 3d conditioning so they've started to break out of their comfort zone they're seeking they're they're more earnest they've gained some level of charge now that they've activated that which is already quite rare now if they hear the enlightenment teachings the momentum of their accumulation of spiritual mass unbeknownst to themselves most of the time will not let them they cannot forsaken the passion that they've activated this lifeline of the seeking impulse that they've started to act on the charge that the power that that has emanated into their lives they've developed a taste for it consciously or not therefore if they hear a teaching it won't turn into just a picture even if they try that and even if they meet a community that's all living inside of a picture of enlightenment it convinced themselves of that being enlightenment mm -hmm. they might fall for that for a little bit because it's just like uh, a child that has a lot of dreams meeting skeptical parents mm -hmm. it gets destroyed similarly someone with a lot of sort of spiritual aliveness and desire the skeptics of enlightenment which are those that believe they already are but like the charge <laughs> of enlightenment like the energy of enlightenment they will inevitably it's like a it's like a vortex of egotism that's hiding and it's going to try to make the spiritual seeker that has activated their passion for the seeking doubt the seeking impulse in many different ways they can fall prey to that. It's very sad to see, but it happens. But it won't typically happen for long if they've already had the blessing of a difficult life or of a self-challenging attitude where they challenge themselves, where they ask the right questions, where they activate the passion. It's difficult to keep that suppressed once it's already been activated. Therefore, I more or less pity those who have never activated that passion and fall into the enlightenment teachings mm. now that is spiritual bypassing this is why the charge is important this is why we need to utilize service to others again i'm not speaking here to service to self because it's not that relevant so we're focused on the path of service to others which is sufficient in developing spiritual mass the only reason we have to understand the negative path really is because why not like you might as well understand it but also because when you're on your path within the illusion of the positive polarity of sharing love and light with others you're going to encounter some challenges that come from the other side so there is some kind of jedi stuff to be aware of mm -hmm. <laughs> you know um to help you maintain your polarity and to help you maintain your momentum but other than that it's sufficient to just apply oneself to the path of service to others and unless you're highly charged already and your message has become filled with love and light and has become filled with the energy and radiance of the creator you're not going to be that bothered by the other side and by the time that you do you already have the power and the charge typically and the knowledge required to interact with that in a sustainable way mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so really all that people need to know at this stage is to get you out of your complacent personal bubble reality your comfort zone utilize the illusion of other selves to apply yourself to radiating towards them good intentions love and light monitor your thoughts every day ask yourself how many of my thoughts today have been that of the creators love and light have been that of how can i be of service to humanity in a genuine way not to boost my ego how can i actually help what is needed what is the calling and in what ways am i uniquely wired and inspired to act on this calling from humanity for clarity for love for liberation for happiness for well-being and to then daily apply oneself to that this is the path it's indirect but it is the most direct of the indirect in some senses mm. path to actually gain that spiritual mass because again it's rare to go from person consciousness to an alive state of enlightenment where you can simply dismiss the illusion and focus exclusively on the I am. It's possible, but it is rare. And even for those that have 
developed access to that, to a degree they're still going to have the daily experience of I'm a body, mind, soul, interacting with a parent, other body, mind, souls. So they still need an understanding of how to navigate those experiences when they're not purely focused on the God state. And that service to others path of shepherding consciousness of activated deliberate consciousness of the individual that has awakened to its more cosmic nature, its more soulful nature, and now has started to charge itself up through its interactions with others and its meditations and contemplations, and transforming its insincere intentions into sincere intentions and so on. It starts to develop and accumulate spiritual mass. Literally, they become heavier with spirit, more densely filled with spirit. And if you're more densely filled with spirit, because there's only so much space, so to speak, mm -hmm. you'll become less densely filled with matter, less densely filled with human concepts, with matter oriented thoughts, because you're filled with spirit oriented thoughts and vibrations. So this is the path of gaining polarity, which from a non dual point of view may sound negative and contradictory, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not and it's actually valuable to understand it and to learn to apply oneself. Okay, well, we just took a little break. Welcome back. Mm -hmm. um, and we were feeling like this topic has been so dense already, with kind of like concepts for people to integrate, and to kind of uh, get a recognition of and a direct experience so that it doesn't just stay intellectual. Mm -hmm. So we want to proceed with maybe the topic of love and wisdom, which becomes relevant past the initial stage of entering shepherding consciousness. And it becomes more and more precisely relevant in the higher stages of shepherding as one approaches the mirror being state. So, but it feels better to make that a second follow up episode, like mm -hmm. part two or something. Totally oh, cool. But I want to finish this one off with describing sort of the first stage of shepherding consciousness and what's required because there is a distinction between the initial stage of going from person to shepherd. And once you've already activated that shepherding consciousness passion, and you've bursted your personal bubble to a large extent, then the love wisdom balance becomes relevant. Before that, it's less relevant. Because you, you don't have the consciousness yet right. to really be available for that, because you're still pivoting back and forth mm -hmm. between sort of personalized egotism, and more service to others oriented egotism. It's still egotism because it still believes it's a separate individual to a degree, but it's a purification of that ego. It's a, it's an ev evolution of the sense of self. So the initial stage, and this is kind of where someone like Anurag comes in, which is someone, for those who don't know him, someone that I've taught with from time to time in my events, where he kind of uh, plays the bad cop in some senses, like he's just kind of on people's cases mm -hmm. and kind of trying to uh, shock them into awakening. Like, what are you mm -hmm. doing? Like, be, you know, uh, towards pushing them towards service to others. And I've done that in my own ways as well, quite a bit in my events. So that's kind of, that kind of describes that stage of nice. like kicking people out of their egotism and into a more meta perspective and an understanding of true priorities and true earnestness and true service to others and dedication and sincerity. Um, and that's kind of where that boot camp sort of approach comes in, because if you've had hypothetically millions of years, but or let's just say you've had 30 years of social conditioning, personal egotism conditioning, selfish bubble conditioning, it's going to take some shock, it's going to take some mm -hmm. shock and awe, it's going to take some empowered instruction, it's going to take a little bit of a push to push people out of their comfort zone mm -hmm. into a completely new way of living and orienting their everyday thoughts aligning their everyday intentions. It, it's a process, right? So again, the three categories of people, not the three stages, the three categories of people, in a sense, are those that are deliberately negatively oriented. You know, and we all know some of those examples from our history books. Then there are the people that are positively deliberately oriented, activated, so there's negatively activated human beings, there's positively activated human beings. And then there is sort of this whole section or pool in between of indifference. 
mm. of just sort of complacent selfishness that's not deliberately trying to destroy anyone else's life, uh, but it's also not trying to save the world, or it's also not trying to make the difference or a difference mm -hmm. even really. Maybe one will entertain some of these thoughts, but it mostly pertains to their social conditioning of what's nice and sort of like, yeah, it would be nice to help the world and to be helpful to others. And it's good. It's that initial sense of kindness and compassion. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, and this forms the majority of people on earth right now, they're vibrationally mute or kind of inactive. Mm, it's making money. It, they kind of live according to a program. Mm -hmm. There's not yeah. a lot of aliveness. There's not a lot of spiritual mass there in either direction. So those are the people that at some point they get sort of ready to no longer be complacent. They get sick of their complacency. They get sick of their sort of indifference, their in-betweenness, their lack of passion and act activism or activity. And they start to apply themselves. They start to polarize, which can express itself in the ignorant form in many ways, politically and so forth. It's a version, like an activism. It's a version of becoming polarized and desiring to break free from just a personal self-concern, indifferent, complacent, low activity bubble. So in a sense, it's good, good start off, good kickoff of the journey into shepherding consciousness. But because there's no map and there's no instruction and it's not clearly elucidated by a lot of sources, and because we're just so attached to our Newtonian way of thinking and our 3D orientation, that whole passion, which is really the passion for knowing oneself and expressing oneself and developing oneself, sort of gets cloaked back into and dragged back down into it's like this passion comes up and then it collapses back into the world as it is. And like it starts fighting the world as it is. And, and then we kind of lose that momentum and we build it back up and then we get kind of disappointed and, dis and despondent and so forth. But if they could apply that passion and build on it, make it compound, then they would begin to accelerate and gain more spiritual mass, more polarity, more metaphysical strength or spiritual strength or power. Therefore, a greater ability of free will to choose freely, free from conditioning, deliberately, actively. So now we're addressing the people who are sort of in the top end of that indifference pool. And therefore, they're looking for more spirituality. They're looking for more activated passion for life, more understanding of life, more service to others and so forth. At this initial stage of entering into shepherding consciousness, it's really important that we kick ourselves lovingly in the butt mm -hmm. every day. That we wake ourselves up out of our self-complacent conditioning and the momentum that that has of comfort. We have to really begin to change our relationship to comfort from being afraid of it being destroyed or losing comfort to being excited to expand our comfort zone and to enter new territories of thought and philosophy and meditation and action and activism and contemplation to deliberately begin to gear our lives towards a greater calling which almost always includes other selves other people to some degree as this symbolized manifest expression in order for a creator to bounce ideas off of itself get to know itself through this polarity and this contrast and gain spiritual mass so we want to utilize that illusion to our advantage and to the advantage of the civilization and other people inspiring them through our example. It's a process of activating yourself. Mm -hmm. It's a process of getting active, getting out of victim state consciousness, getting out of complacency, getting out of fear of lack of dis less lack of comfort, fear of discomfort. And letting go of our attachments to this 3D self-concerned way of living, this bubble of the individual life or the family life, and start activating one's potentials and skills and gifts and applying it to a greater audience. Or it doesn't have to be greater audience. As long as it's a sincere, it can't mm -hmm. just be towards your children, if that's your lifestyle and that's your true passion. Or it can just be towards a partner, or it can just be towards your neighbors, or just be to your family and extended family. It doesn't have to be you don't have to have a stage with thousands of people hearing what you mm -hmm. have to say. That's irrelevant, ultimately. It's helpful to a degree in some ways, but it's really irrelevant when it comes to this principle of becoming activated in service to others. You don't need that. You just have to be sincere, more sincere every hour 
Just aim to be more sincere every hour. Look at yourself. You have to become radically self-honest, which is going to be uncomfortable because you're full of shit. You're full of self-deceit. There's a thousand, a hundred thousand layers of self-deceit and unconscious forms of egotism and complacency and mental laziness and lack of discipline and concentration and willpower. Mm -hmm. They're all hiding out in those layers and they like where they're at. They're comfortable. But there is a desire in you, a seeking impulse for more of the creator to know itself, to express itself, to share with itself, and therefore to know itself even more through these expressions. And when one is sick of the complacency, one is fit for self-honesty. And one, when one is fit for self-honesty, then one is fit for service to others and sincerity. So it's a, a process of activating one's sense of passion for life, for the creator, for knowing yourself and helping others. It's an activation of that seeking impulse. It's a listening to why am I here? Who am I really? What's important in life? So this is the stage where we have to ask the really mm -hmm. important philosophical questions and take them to heart and practice them. Contemplate, where am I full of shit? Where am I hiding? Where am I complacent and comfortable? Where am I afraid to step out of that? Where am I sort of lying and hiding and manipulating towards others? Where am I putting masks up towards others so that I can feel safe and justified in my complacency? One has to become radically willing to, which is where an anurag attitude comes mm -hmm. in. We have to apply ourselves. We have mm -hmm. to pop the bubble. We have to become of service to others. And there's no quicker way to do that than to apply oneself to the symbol of service to others. Because cool. you cannot be of service to others and be stuck in your bubble. Mm -hmm. And Anurag often uses the example, like you can be in a total victim state and like be depressed and stuff. But if someone asks you, what's the time for those five seconds mm -hmm. where you feel like helping them and you look at your watch and you tell them the time, you forget <laughs> about your trouble. Nice. You forget <laughs> about your suffering. <laughs> right. Even just telling the time to someone else can yeah, be an mm -hmm. act of service to others. Um, but, and if something more catalytic happens in your life where you have to make a real choice between mm -hmm. service to another or others, or complacency, then that activates even more. And typically your higher self will orchestrate such events so that you really, when you're ready for it, so that you really have this challenging choice point to activate your passion for life and your purity and your commitment to love instead of having and your commitment to being instead of having and acting and thinking and your commitment to service to others versus comfort and so on. And so that's the, it's, it's that sort of most painful stage of the journey in mm -hmm. some ways of activating yourself out of hypothetically millions of years of complacent thought and conditioning and becoming a spiritually endowed person, be gaining spiritual mass. It requires some discipline. It requires kicks in the butts every day, mm -hmm. it requires activating yourself. This is where in an unconscious fashion, entrepreneurialism comes into play and like motivational speaking comes mm -hmm. into play. It helps you start to ask these questions. It helps you realign mm -hmm. your priorities in life to what's more important and which all has to do with love, purpose, calling, service to others. And it never has to do with, well, in some, in some realms, it has to do with like what people want to acquire for themselves. But even that is an activation, a low level activation, mm -hmm. but it is a starting point. Like how can I accumulate more wealth? Let's go to a motivational speaker and they're going to teach me how to accumulate more wealth. That can be a sincere attempt to some degree, and that can be an initial symbol mm -hmm. to activate the inner energies, to awaken the inner lion, the inner awake, alive charge of spiritual mass. And then later on, they'll find that, oh, well, now I have some of that wealth, mm -hmm. maybe, or maybe I'm, I didn't succeed. Then where do I go? Do I go back into a complacent victim state? Some people do. Or do I realize that actually, what's truly important? whether I attained the wealth or not, or the success that I thought I wanted for myself, whether mm -hmm. I acquired what I went to motivational speaking seminars to acquire. At some point one realizes that's not the answer. That's not what makes me happy. What makes me happy is seeing someone else happy and somehow being able to contribute to that. So this is the start of that shepherding consciousness. And it mm -hmm. requires an awakening, an activation, a self honesty, a mm -hmm. kick in the butt, right? So I just want to leave people with that. That's the initial stage of activating shepherding consciousness within yourself and beginning to transmute the self-complacent muddy little pond 
where the river doesn't flow anywhere, it's just self-concerned, which is neither deliberately service to others, so it's not gaining polarity, and sorry, service to self, it's not gaining polarity in that sense, and it's not deliberately service to others, so it's also not gaining polarity or power or strength in that sense. Without strength, you can't do anything. You can't realize anything. Mm -hmm. You can't realize yourself without spiritual metaphysical strength. You're not going to realize your oneness with infinity mm -hmm. as a human being. You're just not. You only realize that as a God. In order to reacquire your original state as God, you need the charge, the strength. You need the spiritual mass. You need the aliveness, the vibrancy, the desire to pop through these bubbles of self-limitation, belief systems, paradigms, conditioning, and so forth. And it's going to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So you got to develop a positive, exciting, faithful relationship to the discomfort that you're about to mm -hmm. give yourself. And you got to, if, if anything, pride yourself in that. Like, don't pride yourself too much, but pride yourself in your courage to step out of that domain. Nice. And feel yeah. good about yourself for doing that. And give yourself a pat on the back every once in a while if you need it for the work that you have begun mm -hmm. to do and aim to become even more sincere. So it's this delicate balance of kicking yourself in the butt, but doing it with self-love and forgiveness mm -hmm. and kindness, but not so kind that you fall back into complacency yeah. and yeah. not so rude that you fall back into victimization. You want to kick yourself in the butt, but do it in a positive, with a positive relationship towards mm -hmm. that. And if you can nail that balance, you quite quickly escape the gravitational pull of this earth bubble of your 3D way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And you start to gain spiritual insight, inevitably. The more charge you gain, the more wise you become. It's a process, but it does happen. So the homework, if anything, for this session would be to re-listen to the session. Nice. And uh, <laughs> because it's so dense with information, and I want you to ideally understand this experientially and connect the dots to your experience and how you're going to apply this is a question you can answer for yourself. So watch it again, then ask yourself, okay, what are some of the action steps? This is not typically how I operate, but for this stage of the journey, it's important or helpful. How am I going to apply this knowledge and really take a good hard look at my priorities, my desires, what am I investing my energy into every day? Is it complacent? Is it about self acquisition of objects and things and security? Or is it a brave hearted, courageous approach to want to radiate something genuine and be of service to others? And how can I realign my lifestyle, the architecture of my life, my schedule, my activities, my job, my relationships, my thoughts, my meditations, my contemplations, how can I redirect my mind and my body and my world to be more naturally facilitated to have a proper architecture to continuously every day I wake up inspire me towards that direction of greater self knowledge mm -hmm. and greater radiance towards others. Then you're well on your way to shepherding consciousness. And you're well on your way to transcending personhood. And your life's going to be infinitely better. But the transition process can be a little uncomfortable. But the charge that you mm -hmm. get back from it, the strength is worth it. And that will fuel you for more challenge. It will fuel you for more transcendence, for more self-integration, for more self-honesty, for more courage. And you'll attract entirely different lifestyle, an entirely more adventurous lifestyle, um, and a circle of friends, ultimately, that is in support of this. Also, that's a journey, the shifting of your current world into a world that resembles more of that so that you can go even higher and even higher in your frequency. Awesome. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, and then we'll continue about the love and the wisdom part. Mm -hmm. And we'll just make that a part two so Perfect. people can digest this. Cool. Which describes, again, the later stages. Once someone already has activated shepherding consciousness to a large degree, and some of the viewers and listeners here have that, mm -hmm. um, maybe not the majority, but some have. And so it's helpful to address that as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Perfect. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Mirror Talks podcast with Bentinho Massaro. If you love these teachings and you want full access to almost all of Bentinho's recorded material, go to bentinhomassaro.tv. Right now, we're offering a free seven-day trial with unlimited access to everything on bentinhomassaro.tv, including curated playlists, guided meditations, and much more. This is our number one recommendation for you. 
As a subscriber, you'll get first access to these podcast episodes two weeks before they go public. You'll also get access to exclusive Q&As with Bentinho and other content only available to subscribers of BentinhoMassaro.tv. Also, Bentinho recently created a free online global enlightenment retreat. It's eight long-form sessions that coherently guide you through the foundation of his enlightenment teachings. You can watch the free online global enlightenment retreat at BentinhoMassaro.tv or on YouTube. If you're interested in the most current and complete overview of Bentinho's work to date, this is where we recommend you start. Another great resource is Trinfinity Academy, Bentinho's free online school for enlightenment, empowerment, and infinity. Each class is concise and clear and distills one key topic at a time, including homework. We strongly recommend you check out Trinfinity Academy if you want to master the mechanics of Bentinho's teachings. Finally, don't underestimate the value of sharing this episode with the people who came to mind as you were watching or listening. It's a service to them and the collective, and it's also the best thing you can do to support us in getting this message far and wide. We also encourage you to like, subscribe, and leave positive reviews and ratings on your preferred platforms, and follow Bentinho on social media, especially Instagram. Thank you 